In this first video for chapter 10, we're going to take a look at graphs and graph models. Your textbook does a great job of going through a lot of different graphs and graph models. I wanted to point out one that they did not talk about in your textbook, which is the bridges of Kerningsberg. Um, and this is a very well-known problem by Leonard Euler, which we consider the father of graph theory. So essentially how graph theory started is in the city of Kerningsberg, Prussia, which is now Kaliningrad, Russia. The city is set on both sides of the river, and there are two large islands that are connected, and there are a total of seven bridges. And what Euler wanted to do is see if he could walk through the city, crossing each bridge only one time. So as you can see, this is sort of a zoomed in portion of the city. And what Euler did is said, let's make this whole region a node, which we'll get to the terminology in a little bit. Let's make the island a node and the other island a node and the other mainland a node. So essentially we have four nodes. And then what we're going to do is connect those nodes with edges. Again, that's terminology we'll look at. So we're going to connect, every time there's a bridge, we're going to use an edge to connect it. And so we can see that this is the resulting graph that we can use in order to answer the question. So again, though he determined A, that it wasn't possible, B, he determined that using a graph like this instead of using a geographical map um, was much easier. And so from this is the essentially the foundation of graph theory. Whenever we start to learn something new, obviously it's important to understand the definitions and terminology that will be used. So we'll start with the definition of a graph itself. So a graph G is a non-empty set of vertices V and a set of edges E. And we write this as G equals V comma E, where obviously V is the set of vertices and E the set of edges. Now one key point here is that the vertices must be non-empty, which means it's impossible to have a graph if you don't have at least one vertex. And a vertex is just the dot. So there's an example of a vertex. Now these should be labeled A, B, C, D. We'll just use those. Uh, typically they're lowercase letters or you know, an actual label depending on what it is the graph is depicting. One thing I want to point out um, before we start talking about more terminology is that the vertices are the dots and they cannot be replaced with labels. And I point this out only because I've been teaching this for a while. And the biggest mistake that I see students make is let's say I've got a simple graph, which we'll talk about what that is, that connects A to B, um, A to C, A to D, B to C, and D to B. So that's an example of a simple graph and we'll talk about why in just a moment. But what I see students most often do is they will draw in A, B, C, D, but notice I don't actually have any vertices. I'm using the label as the vertex and this will not get you any credit in my classroom. So please make sure that it's very clear that I'm connecting not the letters or labels to labels, but vertices to vertices. So now let's go back and talk about the simple graph. A simple graph is simply a graph that has no multiple edges. So for instance, here I've got my A, B, C, and D vertices. And then the edges are the lines that connect those. And obviously there would be some reason in our graph theory for why those are connected, just like in the bridges problem that we just looked at. We connected them if those land masses were connected with a bridge. Now, this is called a simple graph because there are no multiple edges. When I say multiple edges, I mean B and C is connected only once. I don't have an additional edge connecting B and C. That would make it a multigraph. That's a multiple edge. A pseudograph would be if I actually have a loop that connects an edge to itself. So let's take a look at a multigraph. So again, we should have labels. Labels are important, otherwise the graph really has no context. 
And let's say A is connected to B more than once. Now you might be thinking, well, why would I connect an edge to, I'm sorry, connect a vertex to another vertex with more than one edge? Well, for instance, I live in Omaha. I like to fly to Florida as often as possible, not as often as um, I'd like to. And there are multiple ways for me to get there. I can fly out of Omaha into you know, St. Pete, Clearwater. I can fly to Orlando. I can fly to Tampa. So there's multiple ways that I can get from point A to point B. And I have to represent each of those with a different edge. So this would be considered a multigraph. Um, and notice you don't have to connect each and every vertex. So you can see here, I have point C who's just all by himself or herself, not connected to anything else. So that's just called an isolated vertex um, because there are no connections to any other vertices. Now, a pseudograph can have multiple edges. It doesn't have to have multiple edges. Let me label those vertices again. Um, but a, multi a pseudograph can have multiple edges and can also connect an edge to itself. So this would be an example of a pseudograph where I have multiple edges and loops. The other terminology that I want to talk about on this page in particular is multiplicity. So when we talk about multiplicity, we just talk about how many edges are between two sets of vertices. So A and B, notice there are two um, edges connecting those vertices, so that, that has a multiplicity of two. In our examples so far, we've only looked at undirected graphs. So now we're going to take a look at what happens when graphs are directed. And when we have a directed graph, each edge in a directed graph is associated with an ordered pair, where the first entry tells us the starting vertex and the second entry gives us the ending vertex. So for instance, if I have A, B, C, D, I could have, oops, I could have A to B, where A is the starting vertex and it ends at B. And for instance, maybe A goes to D and A goes to C and C goes to B, but that's it. This is called a simple directed graph, again, because there are no multiple edges, no loops. Now, a directed multigraph is just like a normal multigraph that we talked about before, where multiple edges are allowed, but in a directed multigraph, you actually can have loops. So multiple directed edges allowed and loops. So again, for instance, when we talked before about flying from Omaha to Florida, I might say there are flights from Omaha to Florida and from Florida back to Omaha. And maybe there are flights within Florida itself. So maybe I can fly from Tampa to Orlando. Not that I would want to do that, but perhaps there are. So you can see that there are reasons why we might need graphs to be directed. A mixed graph is a graph that allows for both directed and undirected edges. So again, kind of depending on the situation that you're modeling with the graph, you might have A goes to B and B goes to A, but A and D are connected with an undirected graph and D and C are connected with an undirected graph. Now a mixed graph, again, can also have a loop. So here are three more examples, simple directed, directed multigraph and a mixed graph. Your textbook is full of so many great examples that show how you can model different scenarios with graphs. I didn't want to regurgitate those models for you. So instead, I'm giving you a fresh question that you've never seen before, because this actually deals with the math program at Bellevue University and the prerequisites for each course that you would take. 
So what I'd like you to do is press pause and see if you can model this situation with a graph and you'll have to think about whether it should be directed or undirected, whether there should be any loops or not. And again, when you feel like you are done with this question, um, press play to see how you did. So to get started, good idea to create a vertex for each course. So I'm just going to, I'm skipping the MA just for the sake of not having to write MA a bunch of times, 315, 320, 330, oops. So each of these would need its own node, its own vertex. So if I didn't talk about that already, sometimes vertices are called nodes. Oops, and 475. Now, what we're going to do is think about why I would connect two vertices. And it seems clear that if I want to connect vertices in this particular instance, it would make sense for it to be directed because for instance, for 206, I must have 205 first, but I can't, it's not the same in reverse. So to have 205, I don't have to take 206 first. If it was a two-way relationship, you would use an undirected graph. Here, I'm going to use a directed graph to show the dependence. So let's start at the top to make sure we get everything. MA215 has a prerequisite of MA101. Now, MA101 is not in my program, but it is a course that is a prerequisite. So I would have a directed edge. Let me make that a little bit better. Then MA205, again, you need MA104, which is trig. So don't take calculus without trig, please. And again, I would direct it. And then for M, so I'm just going to check these off as I go. For MA206, I need 205. So to have 206, I need 205. To have 315, I need 205. To have 320, I need 315. To have 330, I need junior or above standing. So I don't need a node for that because there's no prerequisite. If you wanted to create a junior or above node, I guess technically you could, but it seems kind of silly since these nodes are really showing courses. Uh, 335, I need 315 and 320. 405, I need 315. 420, I need 315 and 320. And 475, junior or above standing. So again, I've got a couple of isolated vertices. Again, if you really wanted to, if it drove you crazy because there is technically a prereq, you could say junior and then you would need that for both of those isolated vertices. Up next, we're going to take a look at some graph terminology, anything that we haven't already talked about in this video, as well as some theorems associated with graph theory.